when I started this series, I told you, I asked you this question, is it necessary for history to only focus on kings, on wars, on colonization of countries? Is that all that there is to history? Actually, what makes history really fascinating are the small aspects that do not appear in most history books. One of these is the trade in horses. You may want to know as to whether this is a topic that is worth discussing at all. After all, a horse is one of the most common animals that we get to see wherever we go. But from very ancient times, imported horses were greatly prized because of their strength and their speed. It was considered that the Indian horse was a very weak equivalent. In the time of the Sangam, that is between 600 BC and 300 AD, we have proof of horse being, horses being imported. And there is one line in the Patina Pale which says, Niril vanda nimir paripuraviyum, which means by water came the tall and erect horses. As to where they came from, the poem does not mention, but we know that these horses were invariably imported from Arabia. How these horses made the journey, how were they pushed into the ships, how were they brought out of the ships, how many of them survived the one month or two months that it took for these ships to travel, all of this is a mystery and is not documented. But we do know that a ship on an average carried around 20 or 30 horses. Therefore, the arrival of ships bearing horses was a great event and these horses were highly valued. In Tamil poetry, one of the great saints is Manikavachakar, about whom we know next to nothing other than his wonderful output, which is compiled as the Thiruvachakam. Legend has it that Manikavachakar was a minister in the court of a Pandyan king and one day the ruler gave him money and asked him to go and purchase horses that had just arrived in the port. So, even today, I mean even from this we are able to see that during Pandyan times the horses were coming into the port. Manikavachakar travels and on the way he comes to a place which is called Thiruperundurai. The word Thurai itself means port, but this particular village is not anywhere near the sea. He sees, he has a vision of Lord Shiva there and spends all the money that he has got to build a temple and spends his time there. The king in the meantime is getting anxious and sends his soldiers to find out what has happened. When they come back, he orders that Manikavachakar be arrested and be produced before him. The saint prays to Lord Shiva who tells him, you do not worry, just go and tell the king that in the month of Avani, in the asterism of Mula, when it is full moon, I will bring the horses. So, Manikavachakar or Vadavurar as he was known at that time goes and informs the king, the king is satisfied. Then the month of Avani comes, the asterism Mula comes and it is a full moon night and a handsome horseman arrives with horses. Lord Shiva has rounded up all the jackals in the neighborhood, converted them into horses and he has brought them. The king accords him a grand welcome and that night the horses are all put into their stables. On seeing the full moon above, they realize what they are, they all become jackals once, once again and they begin baying at the moon. The king wakes up on hearing the noise, makes enquiries, becomes enraged and then arrests Vadavurar. Then it is up to Lord Shiva to establish the greatness of his devotee and he is ultimately forgiven. Vadavurar then composes the Tiruvachakam, becomes Manikavachakar and finally merges with the Lord in Chidambaram. While this may be myth, there is no denying that Manikavachakar's poetry has repeated references to Shiva converting jackals into horses and then converting horses into jackals once again. And in Madurai, Avani Mula Vithi, which is a street, still exists. And during the annual festival of the Shiva temple in Madurai, this is still enacted. If this is in Pandya land, in Chola region, we have Tirunavakarsar Stevaram, which also at Tiruvarur speaks of the same thing of Shiva converting jackals into horses. So, obviously, this was a common story in that region. It goes to establish the importance of horse trade. We then jump a few centuries and come to the Vijayanagar Empire, 
in the 14th century. The Vijayanagar Empire controlled much of South India and just to the north of it was the Bahmani Sultanate. Whenever they waged war against each other, victory always depended on who had the better horses. And so both kingdoms kept importing horses from Arabia. During this time, in 1498, Vasco da Gama discovered a direct route to India without the help of the Arabs. And from then on, sea trade came into the hands of the Portuguese. The Portuguese therefore became very important allies of the Vijayanagar rulers. And they had one favor to ask of the king, which was they wanted Mailapur in Chennai to be given to them as their locality. Chennai of course did not exist at that time, but Mailapur did. And why did they want to come here? Because of the legend of St. Thomas. For centuries it had been believed that one of the apostles of Jesus, St. Thomas, had come here, lived here, preached here and died here and was buried here. And so the Portuguese were given this region. They built a fort here which they called San Tome, the town of St. Thomas, and built a basilica over where they believed St. Thomas was buried. When they were coming here by ship, the vessel was rocked by a storm and they prayed and a light guided them to safety. On landing, they followed the light to a distance inland when the light vanished in the middle of a forest. There they decided to build a church in gratitude and they called it the Church of Luz. Luz in Portuguese means light, which is why we still have a Luz church built in 1516 and the entire area is today known as Luz. The Vijayanagar rulers valued the Arabs and the Portuguese to such an extent that wherever they built temples, they depicted sculptures of riders on horses. When you look at them very closely, you realize they are not Indians. They are bearded, they are wearing full shirts and they are wearing trousers. They are clearly Portuguese. Similarly, in Hampi, the capital of Vijayanagar, there is a platform called the Mahanavami Dibba, on top of which the king used to sit to watch the Navaratri celebrations. If you look at the pedestal, you will find sculptures of Arabs leading horses with both hands and bringing them to the king's court. That was the level of importance that horses were given. Then the British came and several things happened and horses continued to remain very important. Rulers ceased to maintain horses themselves. They gave the responsibility to their officers and an officer's rank or status was determined by the number of horses he was expected to maintain on behalf of the king. This had a negative effect. When war came, those who were warring amongst each other bribed officers with horses so that they would get on to their side. This term became horse trading. It remains current even in Indian politics today. Whenever seats have to be won or supporters have to be obtained, we refer to it as horse trading. More in the next episodes to follow. Thank you very much.